Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Again, reminding you that this, not all this teaching, but some of this teaching is, I'm sure, repeated in the sixth chapter of Luke. Uh, some people say that the, 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 the same uh, kind of account, or the same episode, or the same event in the life of Jesus, and just do two different people uh, presenting their angle of it. You know, you hear somebody talk, and somebody says, what do you think of his opinion? Well, he meant this, to the fact, oh, no, no, he didn't mean that, he meant this. Now, now the word of God isn't as arbitrary as that. There are distinctions between these two. The, this one is called the Sermon on the Mount. <coughs> <coughs> Again, I don't think that's a good title. It, that's merely stating the location where Jesus taught. It doesn't give you a clue as to the revelation that's in the sermon. It's only the location. He was, it was a sermon in the mount. And it says that he sat down. Now in Luke's account it says that he was in the plain and that he stood up. Now, now you, nobody's going to mistake a man standing up or sitting down. I mean, you can't say that I'm sitting down right now, at least unless you, you know, you've had too much to... Well, anyhow, uh, you're seeing double. <coughs> I happen to be standing up. Jesus... Uh, and, and the Sermon on the Plain, he's standing up on the Sermon on the Mount, he's sitting down. <clears throat> the difference again, that uh, before Jesus was teaching on the Mount, we're told of a, a great list of miracles. He seemed to demonstrate his power there, whereas in the, in the Sermon he demonstrated his wisdom. You don't get the same context there in, in uh, reading the account that Luke gives. Uh, the, the account seems to suggest in Luke that there were more miracles after he had given this sermon. Again, Luke says that it was after he spent a night in prayer that he gave the Sermon on the Mount, and Matthew doesn't make any reference to that at all. Again, Luke gives you a list of the names of the disciples, and Matthew does not give any list at all. There's no contradiction, basically, if you, if you like to say, you know, if, uh, the, the skeleton of the thing or the structure of the thing is very, very much the same, and why not? Repetition is a law of learning wherever you go. <clears throat> we used to have a teacher and he used to, every time he stood up, now we'll recap. And fellas, well, I didn't bring a cap anyhow, but uh, we'll recap, recapitulate. We'll go back and we'll, we'll start at the point we started out before or we'll pick up from a, from a certain point. And Jesus, to, to use another uh, uh, figure of speech, he, he's driving the nail. The scripture talks about fastening a nail in a sure place. You know, as I've read and reread, and I, I want to thank uh, publicly, thank Keith for asking me to do some teaching or share some thoughts, because it's made me do some digging, and, and uh, it's made me realize again how far off center the Church of Jesus Christ really is. I, I believe the Church today is a total embarrassment to God. I really mean that. And I'm embarrassed to be part of the embarrassment. You see... The standard of Jesus is so lofty, it's so amazing. I, I don't wonder they put him to death. I think I referred last week to the fact that somebody said if every uh, Christian lived this, all we have to do is go out in the world and live the Sermon on the Mount, you know, and the sweetness will come out of us. Well, we're not sugar, we're salt. <laughs> if Jesus said, you know, you're the sugar of the earth, we'd all be sweet and you love everybody, it doesn't matter who they are. That's not what Jesus said. He said, we're the salt of the earth. And again, if a perfect example is what draws people to God, well, why didn't they accept Jesus and fall down and worship him? The most perfect man that ever lived, the holiest man, the man whose life never had a fault or a failure in it, what did the world give him? A crown of thorns. Well, do you expect any better? There are, there are nine beautiful Beatitudes here. Some can divide it and make more, but there are basically, I think, nine Beatitudes. Why not ten? Why not seven? Seven is the number of perfection consistently through the word of God. But there are not seven Beatitudes. There are not ten Beatitudes because ten again is a sign of completion. So it seems to me that God is saying that with, you, you may fully live the uh, nine, nine marvelous Beatitudes here and yet that will not complete your life. There is no completion. There is no finality to the Christian life this side of eternity. I don't care who the greatest saint is, you know, maybe greater than your sainthood, but uh, whoever they, is, they are, they still have some deficiencies. You see, uh, have you noticed God never flatters us? 
He flattens us sometimes. My, sometimes I read the scripture and really I feel somebody, oh, knock me out and it takes me a while to recover. Oh, we, we can exalt ourselves. We don't need any help getting up. I mean, <laughs> boy, we're pretty good at <coughs> self-esteem, aren't we? And, you know, uh, my superiority over others. Now, again, in the, in the version that Luke gives, it says that Jesus looked upon his disciples. And, and nobody... In, <coughs> on God's earth ever could or ever will live the Sermon on the Mount apart from the grace of God. I believe that Jesus here is not just looking at their condition there, he's looking at the fact that when he's finished tutoring them and when they've received the Holy Ghost, then they'll be adequate to go out to the world and live what is in this sermon. You know, the first thought that came to me was this, wouldn't it be wonderful <laughs> to get up tomorrow morning and find everybody in the world living the Sermon on the Mount? It would kill us. <clears throat> no, I mean, it would be overwhelming. I thought, wait a minute, let's forget the world. Wouldn't it be really wonderful if every Christian in the country lived out the Sermon on the Mount during the next day? You said, hmm, all right, let's narrow it down. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all lived the Sermon on the Mount every day? You see, this is... Jesus talks about some people who go back to establish their own righteousness and they have their own little number one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, these, these, their own Ten Commandments kind of thing. And, and, and the scripture warns against that. Now, now uh, Jesus was, well, he, he was pretty hot against the Pharisees, wasn't he? And yet he says in verse 20 of this fifth chapter, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of of the scribes and Pharisees. He didn't mock their righteousness. How can right be wrong? They were doing the right things, but they did them in the wrong way. If their righteousness was uh, so different, Jesus would have said, except your righteousness is different from the righteousness of the scribes. But he didn't say that. It's as though he says here, look, this is the righteousness of Pharisees. Your righteousness must exceed it. You've got to get beyond it. <coughs> you remember a man went up into the temple to pray. <coughs> Little boy was asked when he went home, did you listen in Sunday school? His granny said, yes. Well, what were you taught? Well, we were taught a story. <coughs> About whom? Two men that went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a Republican. <coughs> well, it wasn't a Republican, it was a publican. What did the Pharisee do? He went up into the temple and he went up to the front and he lifted up his voice and they lifted up his arms and tried to get through to, I, I thank God I'm not as other men are. Well, I think that's lovely. I thank God I'm not as other men are. I gl I'm glad I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a liar. I'm not a cheat. I don't do all the lousy things. I thank God I'm not as other men are. But I don't thank God in any righteousness I have. I thank God that he came, worked a miracle in my life, and enabled me to live the life which I now live by the grace of God. But the Pharisee, I thank God I'm not as other men are, well, well, what did he say? I'm not an extortioner. You've got a lot of evangelists who couldn't testify to that. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. You've got a lot of preachers who couldn't even say that. I'm not like these people round about me, but it was quite right that he should have those qualities of righteousness, but again he was asserting his self-righteousness. He was doing what might be right in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was trying to impress God with his righteousness. Now I'm sure God would rather we be righteous than filthy, and yet righteousness is as filthy rags. If, if we think that that merits a place of priority or acceptance into the kingdom of heaven. Your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. For while it was good to a certain degree, it, it was bad in, in another sense. Now again, Jesus Christ isn't just giving a, a, here an education in exemplary conduct. This is a way of life. It's not something you do in order that you may get life. It's something you do because you have life. I don't think anybody defined the Christian life outside of the Bible better than Henry Skugel. He lived mm, before John Wesley. John Wesley was born about, what, I don't know. Oh, okay, <laughs> he died in 1791 and he was 88 when he died. Now you think about that. <clears throat> so uh, somewhere in the 1600s, a little man by the name of Henry Skugel in Scotland, 
he wrote a book which he never intended should be published. It was a manuscript found under a chair where, where he used to sit very often. And he called the Christian life the, li the, the, the Christian life the life of God in the soul of man. You know, I, I just go when people teach John 17 that amazing prayer, which is the Lord's prayer. People go to church and the preacher says, no, we'll recite the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven. That's not the Lord's Prayer, that's the disciples' prayer. Jesus couldn't pray that prayer, the disciples couldn't pray his prayer in John 17. And you know, we immediately leap up to the, uh, the fact that Jesus lifted up his eyes and, and he begins to pray, and we go sweeping up to the high points in that prayer, like jumping on the high points of the mountain pictured over here. But Jesus says he prays what? that they may know his Father, whom to know, that they may know thee, the only true God. And that, he says, is life eternal. Life eternal is knowing the true God. Not intellectually, but by the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that now we've passed from death unto life, that the work of redemption has been made real in our lives. That we become new creatures. I, I think that's a staggering word. Paul, uh, he, he, you know, throws his shoulders back, little dwarf that he was, but uh, not just throwing his shoulders back physically, but morally and spiritually, and say, he says, if any man. Now, he said that to the Corinthians. And in the day when Paul lived, you didn't have to say about a man, he's licentious, he's this, he's that, he's the other. String about 50 adjectives together and make him look, you know, less than a dog or some vile, lousy thing. You just said, he's a Corinthian, and immediately you knew, wow. He's full of sores and scabs. He's like the dirty rascal that was at the gate, uh, uh, you know, the poor beggar that with, with, with sores and so forth. And, and uh, the, the thing is that we've got to recognize again that we have no righteousness of our own. The righteousness comes through Jesus Christ who is able to take the beggar and lift him, the beggar from the dunghill and make him a prince unto God. Now Jesus is, is still shaping these men. You see, we're, we're looking back. I read a statement today that I, I thought was awesome, where, where um, I think it was George Ladd who said that without Jesus Christ, history is, is an enigma. Or, if you want it in a simple word, history is a puzzle. Well, not only is history, but the future is, is a puzzle without Jesus Christ. Jesus comes into the world and he is, again, uh, the, this, this Sermon on the Mount actually is, is a full-length portrait of Jesus Christ. He was everything that he taught. Well, I wonder how many teachers we can say that of. Well, he teaches it, but, you know, you, you, do you know so-and-so? Yes, he's a nice fellow. Isn't he a great fellow? Yes, but, and then, oh, oh. There's always some little wart or something they know about him and they, you know, lest you think he's totally sweet, <coughs> he's got some poison in him. You know, lest you think he's a straight and upright, I want to tell you a dirty trick he once did, there's the but, the but, the but there. But there is no blemish in Jesus Christ. He's perfect. There's no blemish in his te teaching. And again, the uh, these nine Beatitudes. All right, seven of them. Well, uh... I think that the, the, the first seven of them are, uh, are really moral or state a, 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 an active moral condition. It's something that we're working out. The last two have action in them, but not the action that comes from us to the world, but the action of the world to us. You see, uh, God, uh, the Lord makes it very clear, in the world you shall have tribulation. It's a guarantee. All you say, if you're going to live the life that God wants you to live, a life of, of, of moral rectitude, and I believe that righteousness, righteousness is, is external rectitude. It's, it's your, your moral life which is, which is straight and correct. Holiness is the inward rectitude, which makes possible the outward rectitude. Unless the heart is pure. You see, there's everything in this, in this sermon. As I say again, if Jesus had begun by saying, Blessed are the pure, we back off and say, Well, I'm sorry, I'll have to go away, I'm far from pure. But, but he starts, as he, any, anyhow you would imagine he would start. Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
You know, as I thought over this, I thought for at least 60 years I've been going to conferences. And the main part of those conferences, they were holiness conferences. And yet I can't remember once, <clears throat> in all the conferences I've been in, many parts of the world, I have never heard a series of sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. I've heard sermons on the higher life. Well, that, that suits us. I never heard a series of sermons on the lower life, did you? Uh, you? You get a book, How to Be Filled with the Spirit. Ever see a book on How to Be Empty? No, 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 we, we always strain for that which is so attractive to us. What do we think about in poverty? Oh, poverty, oh no, you, you shrink from poverty. Poverty suggests destitution, inferiority, getting handouts and other things. Well, that's exactly what Jesus meant, but not poverty in the physical realm. Though he's always jagging at riches and uncertain riches and, and don't trust in riches, and riches will bring a snare, you better watch. But he's talking about poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor. Well, uh, we've changed that in modern translations again to happiness. Now, are you going to say if you go to a ghetto or go to some, some place where everybody's shrieking with poverty, they're ill-clothed, they're ill-fed, they, they, they look ill and, and their clothes are wretched and the conditions are wretched, are you going to suggest that's a state of blessedness? God doesn't say anything on poverty or riches as far as that goes. That, that's no blessedness. Poverty doesn't breed humility and gentleness. Poverty, poverty, it seems to me, breeds malice and hatred and envy. The very opposite of these treasures of the Spirit. For after all, what, what, what are these uh, beautiful nine uh, gifts here? They are gifts or fruits. What are they? Well, I think they're the crown jewels of the soul. I think they're the, the things you should strive for and I should strive for every day. I think they're the cosmetic, cosmetics of our spiritual life. I think they're the very things that the world outside expects to see amongst us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Have you noticed how often that marvellous man, he was a king, he had armies, he had wealth, he had everything he wanted. He was number one on the charts for his songs, David. Never got any royalties for them yet, but he's going to get them. He's a kind of a superman in the world. And yet he says, bow down thine ear and hear me, for I am poor and needy. He says, this poor man cried. What, is he pretending? No, I don't have all that stuff there, really, you know. No, no, he's not saying that at all. <coughs> he's recognizing in himself he has nothing by which he can commend himself to God except his poverty. Again, in that old hymn, nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to that fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poverty, surely, of spirit is, is the opposite of self-assertiveness. Haven't you secretly somewhere in your life, uh, somebody kind of said to yourself wistfully, I wish somebody could really discover me. Hmm? You know, my hidden potential. Man, if somebody could really just get me and shape me, you know. I, I'm really a new, whatever you're interested in. In art, you might say, well, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a Rembrandt. I've got it all stored in there. Or I'm a Michelangelo. Or uh, in music, I'm a Schubert. Or in something else. I've got so much hidden quality and hidden talent. And Oh, if it could only come out. Hmm? It's the very opposite Jesus is looking for. Again, he didn't go to rich men and distinguished men. He didn't go to, to them rich socially or intellectually. He went to active men, fishermen. He went to a tax gatherer. Why, they, they, they said of the men after Pentecost, these men are poor, they're unlearned and ignorant men. They weren't men of ostentation. They weren't men of social standing. They weren't men of already recognized ability. The, the whole tenor of Scripture says God takes the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are. I used to have a friend and he, he was always saying, I wish we could find some are-nots. 
Arnots? You mean the Argonauts? No, no, not the Argonauts, the Arnots. Well, who are the Arnots? Well, that's what we want to know the Arnots are. Because he takes the things that are not. In this area, actually, our deficiencies are our advantages. Now, he's not talking about poverty, you know, that wretched, wretched modern word we use so much. Oh, he, hasn't he got personality? I remember somebody discussing a preacher and they said, well, man, he preaches good stuff, but you know, like he doesn't have much pulpit personality. What personality got to do with it? I'd rather hear a blind man with one leg and one arm and one ear and one eye that could really speak the things of God than a superman with a big toothpaste smile, as Dr. Toz used to say, oozing out personality, you know, and uh, doing all his stuff. <laughs> What's personality got to do with it? Jesus is talking here about character. <coughs> oh, it's a horrible day of personality, isn't it? And personality usually struts. I mean, uh, he's a personality. Why? Uh, because he stands a bit higher than somebody else. Because he, he shows his ability. Now, somebody over there has far more ability. I'm not talking about natural shyness. Shyness is not humility. I'm not talking about somebody who's born naturally with what we call an inferiority complex, which the Apostle Paul never mentioned as far as I remember. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. You can have all those things, and I've seen people completely turned around by the grace of God. I remember a man who went to our church. They said he was the shyest boy that ever entered in that church. And after he got saved and filled with the Spirit, he became as bold as a lion. And I am. <clears throat> because when I went to that church, I was shy. I always sat on the back seat. You couldn't get me on the platform to say anything. I wouldn't memorize anything. I was too nervous. I lived in a house where I had just one sister. Just one, you see. Scriptural. No man can serve two masters. <clears throat> and so I had just one sister, and she was super brilliant. Oh, brother, could she play an organ? She played a three-manual uh, pipe organ. And, and she had a gorgeous voice. And you know, when any visitors came to the house, I knew what it was. Uh, Annie dear, uh, run and put that special ribbon on your hair. Uh, I want you to play for so and so. And she'd go up to the piano. Here's little Jack Len, Len Horner, not Jack Horner, sitting in a corner. <laughs> and my sister struts the stuff. Now, now play that. Now, now sing this. Now do that. Now say, yeah, 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 yeah. Get out of here. When they've gone, I'll pull your hair after this anyhow. But anyhow, I, I, I couldn't bear that she got so much priority and I was left behind. And, and I was shy. But I wasn't very humble. Oh boy, I had a temper like a tiger. My besetting sin it, uh, with one person, it's pride. Another pa person, it's, it's uh, some other secret thing. Another person, it's anger. Mine, mine was temper. I had a blazing temper. My sister would sit at the piano and say, man, if the visitor, I'd have thrown the piano at her if I could have lifted it up. I couldn't, so I, 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 I'd throw an apple or an orange or something else at her. No, no, Jesus isn't talking about inferiority. He isn't talking lack of personality. He isn't talking about that shy person. He isn't talking about that person who feels that they're born inferior. He's not talking about that at all. You can have all that and yet be upright inside and arrogant inside. The little boy said when his, when his daddy beat him, put him over the knee, I'm still standing up inside. Huh? Do, you, do you still stand up inside when, when it looks as though you've been wiped out? Poverty of spirit. Well, well the whole construction of scripture uh, 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 works around this actually. Again, uh, uh, poverty in itself does not breed humility. It, it, it breeds covetousness. It breeds envy. Often it breeds hatred, hatred. So he's not talking about social poverty, or even physical poverty, or mental poverty. He's talking about blessed who are the poor in spirit that they recognize that they have nothing. There's an old song that says, I nothing have, I nothing am, glory to the bleeding lamb. Now that doesn't mean I go in the world and say, hey, just, just be careful because you mustn't hurt me I'm, I'm just a little gentle Christian and, and we're very breakable you know where you, if you hurt us we, we bleed in every pore of our bodies and, uh, and we don't sleep for weeks and we don't no no it's not that junk there's a poverty which is hateful and there's a poverty which is commendable and we're talking about that in this this self-effacing 
that I don't preserve, deserve priority over you because I have some gift or some ability and if I do have it it's only on this level it's not that level it's not that way with God one of the awful things one of the great showdowns I think in eternity will be our, what false estimations we've had of our own ability and, and even very often of our own ministries I've got to recognize it's all of God I've, I've nothing but death in myself life comes from him Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, if you read the first uh, seven of the Beatitudes, you think, well, what, what in the world is the advantage in this? But Jesus is taking a long distance view of it. Do you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You cannot enter through your own righteousness. The only way you can enter, I, I, I suppose I was as bad as morally good as any guy in our, our city of third of a million people or more than that I lived in a home where, where everything was righteous you, if you were if there was a suspicion of a lie or duplicity my dad had you marked and measured and boy you got into trouble for it we kept the Sabbath day holy man I, I got two cents because <clears throat> cents could do something in those days I got two cents for spending money and I was expected to put one of them, the thing that needled me was not, wasn't that I got two, I was expected to put one in the missionary box. <laughs> that was pretty rough. I didn't know anything about giving not grudgingly or necessity. I'm sure I put it grudgingly and I put it in because it was expected of me. Movies belong the devil. You didn't, you didn't give your money for, to, to keep harlots and sinners in Hollywood going. The literature in the house was all godly literature. It was Christian magazines or life stories of famous missionaries. And my heroes weren't footballers. There was never a word of sport in our home. It was all godliness round the table. It was all he healthy, godly conversation. And I think if anybody could have made it to heaven under their own steam, I could. But I remember one night in a meeting when I was 14 and the Lord began to deal with me. And man, I felt the worst leper outside of heaven. I began to feel there's no hope for me at all. I've been building on my own righteousness, on my own goodness, on, on my own good works, on my own kindness. The fact that I love to help people, that I love to do all that I could do for others. And then I found out that it was all on this level. There was no relationship with God. Because I heard most preachers say we're all bad and I turned to my breath, forget it. <clears throat> You used to be a drinker, you used to be a fighter, you used to be this. You, well, I haven't been any of those. So I'm not bad. <clears throat> and then one day I discovered I wasn't bad, I discovered I was dead. That didn't help me. <laughs> See, we, we, we thunder at people as though secretly you're, you've all got a double life. Secretly you're all filtering something out of the, out of the cash box. <coughs> secretly you're all doing this, that. No, 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 no. The, that's not God's argument with us. God's first argument with us is that we're dead in trespasses and in sins. These men have passed from death unto life in that sense. They must have because the Lord says, Rejoice, for what? That your names are written in heaven. And yet he has to admonish them to, to stay poor in spirit. I think it was old, what was his name now? Daniel Steele, I think he was a Lutheran. And he made one statement that I can remember. He said this, that pride is the last thing to leave the human heart and it's the first thing to come back. It's so subtle the way it gets in. You see, <coughs> well, I'm the right to assert myself. I'm the right to have, uh, you know, count up my own personal values. No, 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 no. Not when I talk about the spiritual life. I'm a debtor. <clears throat> All my life through, I'm a debtor, I'm poor. I have to come every day to God and say, Lord, I'm poor. I bow down, I'm poor, I'm needy. Well, that's what you think. That's what you think about somebody who's poor, don't you? They're always looking for a handout. They're always looking for a lift. They're always looking for somebody to be a, a benefactor. <clears throat> well, that's why God loves us. He loves us to see us come and ask, 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 and he'll give it to you. <coughs> don't assume you have it just to get up in the morning. Your relationship with God may be pure and lovely. But Lord, I need your strength today. I need your wisdom today. Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Think again of the Apostle Paul. He's writing there to the... Uh, he's writing in 2 Corinthians. 
chapter 6. And in verse 1 he says, We then as workers together with him, we beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't misuse it. How much do you esteem this book above every other book? How much do you esteem fellowship with the Father above fellowship with somebody else? You see, John says first, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ and with one another. I think we've just turned it round. Our fellowship is with each other. You know, a short service. I go to churches sometime and they say, well, remember after this morning's meeting, we shall meet in the fellowship hall and, and we shall have uh, sandwiches and this, that and the other. And oh, brother, the fellowship hall and the fellowship with each other can last two hours and they all enjoy it. And what is it? It's the country club kind of sanctified. It's getting round and, and saying, ah, I met so-and-so and so-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so told me this so-and-so. Our fellowship is first of all with the Father. I, am I so impoverished that I say every day, Lord God of hosts, I don't step out into a wicked world. It's, it's the antithesis of everything you've mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor, no, blessed are the rich. Blessed are the meek, no, blessed are the self-assertive. Blessed are the peacemakers, no, blessed are the pacemakers. <coughs> It's horrible when you come to realize again that in many areas of the world we have broken down heathenism and darkness with the gospel and we followed it with bottles and bullets. I remember 50 years ago a man coming from Central Africa and he said when he came he said the, the, the people there said look you brought us your God in a, in a little black book. You brought us your devil in a little black bottle. Madeleine Murray wants to pull down the structure of the, of the United States. She wants to get rid of the gospel. Well, any idiot can, uh, can set fire to a building. Some boys have set fire to buildings this last two weeks. Burn the school down, burn part of another school down. Any idiot can burn it down. There's not those three boys together couldn't put the thing up. They wouldn't know where to start, how to, how to lay the foundation or before that to prepare for the sewers and prepare where the electric current comes in and other things. Uh, and, and, and so they don't know anything about it. So any fool can pull it down or burn it up, but who can build it? I noticed Madeleine Murray and uh, Carl Sagan with his sneering, uh, alluring, you know, you, you're pretty mild and meek and insane if you believe in the new, uh, Bible story of creation. I noticed uh, folk like that don't ask the government. They get it for two million dollars to go up the Amazon to spread their damnation. Why don't they go to the uncivilized? There are tribes up the Amazon we know. Go up the Amazon, go up the Orinoco River, take another branch of that, you know, like a tree that has all its branches, and you go up the main branch of the Amazon, and, and you get up here, and there's the Orinoco River here, and then when you get up on the Orinoco, as though that's the Orinoco, then there's a branch here, a branch there, a branch there. There are Indians, there are people there, and heaven knows. They've never heard the gospel. It's a reflection on the fact that we haven't found something which is adequate for the life that now is as well as that which is to come. To many people the Christian life is, oh, that will be glory for me. What about the glory now? Isn't it glory now? <coughs> come on, has he, has he worked the miracle in my life? Has he taken out the pollution? Has he taken out the perversions? Has he shown me that while I'm poor in myself, that I can be rich in God? That's what Paul's talking about here. But I want you to, to notice in verse 1 of chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, he says, We then, as workers together with God, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, what did he get? Here's one of the greatest souls that ever lived. What, what, was his, what were his conditions? Verse 4. In all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love and fame, by the word of God, by the power of God, the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, evil report and good report, deceivers and yet true, unknown and yet well known, dying and behold we live, chastened and not killed, as sorrowful and yet rejoicing, as poor and yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Now, in, in, I ask you before God, do you, do you know a preacher, do you happen to know a preacher in a little town you left, or the city you left, who fits into that category? 
Somebody sent me a letter today. A certain man on, on, on uh, the broadcast on TV, uh, his wife says, now, my, if there's any man that deserves help in this country, it's my husband. And he's going to be 46. And I want everybody to send him one dollar for every birthday he's had. Yeah. Just 46 dollars, you know. And that request goes out to two or three million people. Well, he'll have a bucket full if they all send him 46 dollars, won't they? Won't they? Isn't it the opposite of this? The guy already has a jet plate. His wife, when she puts her hand up, you, you, she'll blind you because she's got great big lump, lumps of junk on her fingers there. And her mother sits at the side of her in the office and she's got loads, but when visitors come, they pull them all off and stick them in the drawer. Well, that's hypocritical, isn't it? I mean, if they're genuinely uh, the, the gift of God for our exceeding greatness, I mean, we have built up his glorious kingdom. I had a man that sang for me in a conference in, in a great church in Canada some years ago and one night I, I, I preached partly on uh, Sodom had no Bible. He, he was furious. He came to my bedroom at two o'clock in the morning. We were staying in the same private hotel and he thundered at the door and he says, I can't sleep. I want to tell you something. Well, I didn't like the look of him much any time, but I sure didn't like the look of him at two o'clock in the morning. He weighed about 250 pounds and his face was red with fury. He said, I want to tell you, I almost walked on the platform tonight and knocked your head off. I said, wouldn't that have made good headlines in the Canadian newspaper, huh? Evangelist's head was knocked off by his gospel singer. <laughs> doesn't that sound great? <laughs> but you know, the main thrust of his testimony always was, you know, I was having an audition with this film company. I was having an audition with so-and-so. And it was estimated, I, this is when money was money, I would have made at least $30 million in the next X number of years. And the Lord asked me to sacrifice it all for him. Well, what a privilege. I mean, the Lord hasn't asked me to say, sacrifice $30 million. I haven't known, uh, there are people who would give that to hear me sing. But they're in the grave. Uh, they uh, no I don't uh, I don't want to strut like that what, what has he given up as soon as somebody says you know what I've given up for the Lord I think all you've given up is hell that's all you've given up <laughs> you're not going to persuade me you've ever no man that ever lived ever did God a favour get that in your mind nobody ever does God a favour all the favours are from him here is a man in stripes and imprisonment he's in poverty he says, I'm shivering in this jail and all I ask is, could you please bring my coat when you come along? He doesn't say, can you get me out of it? We'll have a night of prayer. Will you appeal to Caesar? He says, I've learned whatever state I'm in. And man, his state was usually a bad state and a poor state and an inferior state. But if a man knows he has all the treasures of the kingdom inside of him, what on earth is he going to worry about the outside for? You can't make a spiritually rich man poor. And you can't make a rich man outside who doesn't have God, you can't make him truly rich. Think of his statement here. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. That's logic, isn't it? As poor, yet making many rich. He's talking about two kinds of poverty there, I'm sure. He's talking about physical poverty, and he's talking about spiritual poverty. If I was writing his life story, I'd say, do you know what? This is the greatest man that ever lived. I can prove to you from Scripture that the Apostle Paul did everything that Jesus did except walk on the water. He raised the dead, he healed the sick, he cast out demons. Man, this man's got all the spiritual wealth and I don't have to uh, try and prove that to you, I just take, it, take his own record. And you know what? He wrote more epistles than anyone else. Fourteen epistles if you give him Romans, uh, if you give him Hebrews. And yet, you know what he says of himself? He says... I am the least of all saints, the chief of sinners. Now, if I was writing his story, I'd reverse it. I would say he was the least of all sinners and the chiefest of all saints. He isn't putting a show on. You say, well, was he the chief of sinners? Yes, because he said, going down that Damascus road, he says in the 26th chapter of Acts there, I think he's embarrassed and blushing as he said it, he said, when I went down that Damascus road, I was breathing out threatenings. He says his hobby was dividing Christians, breaking up their homes, driving them into strange cities. 
like the communists are driving the Afghan people over the, over, over the borders there into Pakistan. That, that's what Paul did. That was his hobby. He expected a, a, a supersized reward in heaven because he's putting down these people who say that Jesus is greater than Moses and the blood of Jesus Christ is greater than our weekly sacrifices. And he never got over that. It's like old Samuel Rutherford said that if, if ever anything becomes more wonderful to you than your own salvation, you're in trouble. I don't care whose miraculous conversion. You hear Nicky Cruz here, somebody else, so what? The greatest thing in the world is that God in infinite mercy came to this heart of mine. I don't know what was in your heart. I don't know what's in it now. I know what was in my heart. And when I think that he can cure the plague in the human heart, as I say, I, I, as I thought about it today, God, what an insane world. As maybe I referred last week, we're, we're like a man with a check for a million dollars and we refuse to cash it, cash it and we live in a free house every day and, 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 and our clothes are worn out and we're lousy, we'd like a bath, we'd like to go to a good bed, but we're, we're not sure if this, if this bill is uh, genuine, you know. Of course, it's signed by Rockefeller if he was still around and, and it bears this and it bears the name of the uh, bank of the, some bank in the United States <coughs> and he quibbles and quarrels about it and he's living in starvation. And you've got people who are saying, well, if you prove this or that or the other about the Bible and they've got a million dollar check and all the time they're morally and spiritually bankrupt. What an insane world. They're going to build up our armaments now. We've told Russia we can't do anything. We're asking them to hold the war off till 1990 because we won't have any adequate machines, we won't have any adequate uh, uh, submarines and we won't have anything else. So will you kind of, uh, you know, ease off a bit? Don't, don't come and blow the nation up, we, we want to meet you on equal terms, you know. Um, please don't get any, you know, if you promise not to burn us up more than 400 degrees in the oven, well, we'll just promise to burn you up 400 degrees in the oven. That's what you call intelligence and wisdom. The answer to all our problems is found here in, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount. The answer to injustice. The answer to pride. The answer to covetousness. You see, that, that's often, it's not always so. There's, there's no one statement you can throw over the rich or over the poor. But very often, even, even riches, uh, gender, they, they foster covetousness. Wasn't it Rockefeller? Somebody asked, well, how many millions do you have now? Oh, I've, I've, I've nearly a hundred. Well, when is a rich man satisfied? He said, when he gets a bit more. See, there's always something to reach after. Riches in themselves don't satisfy any more than poverty does. Again, happiness depends on the outside environment. Blessedness depends on my relationship with God. Again, who for the joy that was set before him? Paul is in prison, a stinking, stinking prison. Not, not, well, not one of these holiday inns that we call prison now, where the guy says, I'm not eating that, that egg isn't done, get me, you know, bring me some eggs properly done, and the toast is too burned, and... Oh, they've been objecting to, uh, they can't have coloured TV, just, I mean, it's terrible, the, the, the suffering they have in jail. Just black and white TV, <coughs> instead of coloured. And man, they're suffering all kinds of privations, they think. Paul's in the most dire need, destitution. <coughs> and he hasn't got number one thought about himself because he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I kind of think the devil had a, a day holiday and gave all the demons a day holiday the day that Paul died. I kind of think he said, you know, there won't be any freak like him round about. You know, there was no way at all that we could embarrass that man. You can tell him he's dumb, you can tell him he's, he's missed his chance, you can tell him he, he could have been the greatest scholar in the world, and, and you can't face him. You can lash his body and he won't squeal about it. You can put all kinds of pressure on him. You can, you can tear his revival party up. That's what they did. Even godly men found he was too hard to handle. Demas hath forsaken me. Alexander's gone somewhere else. He writes it all off simply in a sentence. He says, all men forsook me. Boy, that's a great place to be in. But the other half of the text finishes it. He says, all men forsook me. Nevertheless, the Lord stood by me. And you know, the only way to find our riches sometimes is to lose every other external thing to find out what we've got. We so get caught up in false thinking and, and false estimates. 
the poor in spirit. How can you rob a man who has nothing? Huh? <clears throat> you know the great joy of having nothing? You can't lose anything. I think in the print shop the other, the other night there I saw um, Martin sitting on the floor and I said, you remind me of the old hymn, that he that is low need fear no fall. <laughs> you see, if you've no estimate of yourself, nobody can pull you down. If somebody says you're a nobody, you're this, you're not that, and the other, you say, so what's new? Yeah. You didn't need to tell me that, the Lord told me that. And you know what? I don't want to be a somebody. I want to remain a nobody that God can make me a somebody for His glory. If you've read any of the books of Amy Wilson Carmichael's, and you should read every one, they're just amazing books. I don't know anyone over the years who's used more photography than she has. You know, she, she, she's going to explain about the true vine, and on one page is a gorgeous picture of, of a, a fruit-bearing tree. And you turn over, she's going to talk about... <coughs> <clears throat> pardon me, living waters and there's a waterfall coming out she, she's absolutely <coughs> was absolutely brilliant even 50 years ago in using pictures but one day a bishop in England went through all her beautiful books and he said I was overwhelmed with the fact that while she had used hundreds of pictures there wasn't one picture pardon me there wasn't one book that had a picture of herself in it Well, that's not like the magazine you get, is it? I know one magazine I get, and if the fellow's picture isn't on every page, it was because he's sick. he was sick, he couldn't get photographed that day or something. <laughs> huh? Oh, self-esteem. Hmm? I mean, the Lord, I, I don't know what they think. Okay. Jesus says we're not of the world. Forget its standards. Be an idiot if need be in the, in the idea of the world, so what? The only way that a believer can really live is the spirit is bearing witness. With my spirit, I am a spirit, and his spirit bears witness with my spirit, not only that I'm a child of God. Paul more than one says, I call the Holy Ghost to bear witness. I'll tell you how we know our poverty, when in no way we're asserting ourselves when nobody can offend us. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing can offend them. Do you live in that? Is that your address? Hmm? Psalm 119, verse 100 and... I always forget whether it's 165 or 156. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing can offend them. You know, the devil's clever. He must be. He's had 6,000 years of studying human nature. And yet, you know what? He can't hit nothing, can he? You can't hit nothing. If there's nothing there, you can't hit it. If you've nothing, you can't lose it. If you're dead, nobody can kill you. But oh, when you think of this, that as I come empty, supposing I have natural ability, suppose I have this, that, and the other, that I think would really be useful in the service of God, and I've got to lay it all on one side, and I say, Lord, here I am. I want to be totally emptied of all my own ability and adequacy and self-confidence and so forth and you just come in and, and if I'm the least of all saints and if I'm the most despised or forgotten person here or somewhere else so what does it matter? Wouldn't you rather be the least in the kingdom of God than the greatest in the devil's kingdom? Hmm? What about the day when we're known as we... He knows us now and we don't know ourselves. That awesome day of rewards. Sure, history is an enigma without, without Jesus Christ. It's, it's a puzzle if you don't interpret Scripture upon me, life according to Jesus Christ. But look, when you think of the future without him, that there's no future. It doesn't make sense. But if you live, as it were, with one eye on eternity and one eye on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and realize there are people all over the world tonight who are nobodies. They're just away in stinking holes. They're in jails. or uh, they're, they're not given priority as they should have it. Time after time, young preachers come to me and say, you know, oh, when I was, before I went to seminary or before I, I started to study for the ministry, I thought our uh, denomination was so marvelous. But when I've got into it now, I discover there's politics in it and... Uh, 
I, we, uh, Mr. So-and-so has been the assistant to Mr. So-and-so for 20 years. And everybody said, well, when old so-and-so goes, you know, so-and-so's going to step in, he knows the ropes, he can run this place, he does it when the, the, the president's been away for a week or a month or somebody, he can step in and fill the place. And Mr. So-and-so died suddenly the other day, and you know what they did? They put his son-in-law in that job. Oh dear, that's terrible. Well, I don't think it should be, I'm not saying it's right. But you know, it, it catches the other guy out who does the whimpering. He fully expected he was adequate and sufficient, and for some reason God didn't get in that place. What is it in Proverbs where it says, Promotion cometh not from the east, nor from the west, but from the Lord. We were having an annual conference in a church that I pastored years ago, and people came from a few countries and it wasn't big by American standards maybe we got nearly 2,000 people there and I was in my office <clears throat> you know waiting for people to arrive usually the preachers came first and we ticked them off and sent them here and sent them there and uh, one little fellow came and sat just inside the entrance of the church he is a rather weak looking man he's, he hasn't just you know outstanding he's not six foot two broad shouldered handsome wavy hair all the other essentials for some important evangelist or somebody just almost a, a negative personality <clears throat> well one of the big shop preachers had been in my office and I said to him well you're staying at so oh god that's there are lovely people lovely people you're a beautiful home well I think I should walk up there I won't take a bus I've been in a train all day I'll walk up there and, and going out he saw this little fellow and the, he said to him uh, <clears throat> good evening he said, good evening Oh, have you come to the conference? Yes. Well, you're rather early, aren't you? I was told to come tonight. Oh. What is your name? He gave his name. Oh. <clears throat> oh, you're, uh, mm. you're, you're one of the speakers, aren't you? Yes, I believe I am. Oh, oh, come with me uh, to Brother Abner's office. Came up and he said, uh, you, you haven't met this brother before? I said, no, I've heard about him a lot. Actually, he's one of the finest teachers in the Bible School of Wales, which, as you know, was founded by who? Rhys Howells. He's been there at least, I'm sure, 30 years and never had any pay for it. He's trusted God to meet his needs. And so I said, oh, well, you're staying in the same house as this brother. He'll take you. It's a, he wants to walk. I'd be happy to walk. He had a little attache case about this size. That's all he had for, for about six days to stay there. And when they got walking out, my friend has a big stride. He's an athletic fellow. He, all, he went to the swimming bath every day and swam 30 lengths of, of a full, almost an Olympic-sized pool, 30 lengths there and back, never stopped, and got out, dried off, and walked home again, didn't take the bus or anything, a real he-man. Intellectually, he was brilliant. Spiritually, he was a good guy. And they're going up the road, and he thought he'd give this fellow a little encouragement. He talked to him about the Scriptures and talked to him about the Lord and... And he uh, had to show his Greek, you know. He said, uh, of course, brother, you see, in the Greek it says this. Uh, the, the Greek tenses are rather complicated. Little fellow says, yes. And he said, in this particular case, it's in this tense, you see. Uh, did you hear what I said? It's in this tense, you know. He said, yes, but uh, in Matthew 5 and 24, it's in another tense. Hmm. This guy's not as dumb as he looks. Uh, yes, yes. It's really an old-fashioned English word, though, you know. Yes, he said, but in Chinese, in the Mandarin language, it... It's what? Well, it, it's, it's... It's this kind of word. In the Welsh language, we say it this way. Uh, in Latin... The, oh, there's a wonderful, wonderful derivation in the Latin language. It's... And my friend began to think, boy, I thought this guy didn't know anything. I'd better keep quiet. Maybe it's me that doesn't know anything. You know, that little man stood up there and it was just as though you were spraying the atmosphere with fragrance. Other fellows got up, you know, since I saw you, I've been preaching in four different countries. I, I guess I must have preached to about a million and a half people and uh, <laughs> I did this and that and the other and I had dinner with so-and-so and I had lunch with so-and-so. Big old me, I, 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 you know. He got eye trouble. 
<laughs> the other little fellow never, never asserted himself at all. He felt all the time he was straining to, to keep himself out of the way and, and give glory to Jesus. He recognized his poverty. That all I have I draw on the riches. And we use that word according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. But you see God can't fill you if your head's full of your own ideas and your mind's full of your own things and your, your, your heart is full of your own ambitions and something else is full and your will is full. God's problem is not to get us full, God's problem is to get us empty. His problem is not to clothe us, his problem is to strip us. Again, naked come to thee for dress, and helpless look to thee for grace, and foul I to that fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die. The final thing surely is that church of Laodicea. In the other churches they've got trouble with who? The priests, domineering them. What's the problem in Laodicea? The pew. It's a democratic church. We're going to run it. Listen, you listen to us. We're going to plan it this way and plan it that way and plan it the other way. Do you think there's any way that the church of Jesus Christ tonight can look up into the face of God and, and, and say we're, we're poor? If you take the seven phases of the churches, whatever other theological uh, battles people have, they nearly all come down to Laodicea and say, well, that's the last church, it's the seventh church. Seven is the number of perfection. Seven is at the end of the line. Laodicea. And that's the age in which we're living now. Lazy, lousy, if you like. Laodicean church. Well, what did it say of itself? Well, it didn't say anything about Smyrna and the other churches, Philadelphia. It says, I am rich and increased in goods. I have need of nothing. The exact word of that would be, if you translate it literally, I have made myself rich. I have supplied my needs. And that's what she was. Amongst other churches, maybe the end of it. I'm rich. I'm increased in goods. I mean, what do we need? I mean, look at this palace that we have. Look at our stained glass windows. That's the finest organ there is in, in, in America. A uh, German has only built two of them, and we've got one of them in our church. That's what they told me in the church I was in up north. The organ cost $300,000. A lady gave it to us. They may as well have had a tin whistle for all I cared. The woman that played it looked as though she'd four fingers in a cast. She couldn't get anything out of it. She was playing uh, something from Bach. I wish she'd left it Bach in the, in the Bach room, but anyhow, <laughs> she was making a struggle on the organ. Did, does God look down on her? Uh, all right, the guy's got a class cathedral. What is the church? Is the church poor today? <coughs> We're rich. Look at our scholarship. You can't be a pastor in our church now without a degree. You must have so many years of training. My, you should see what we're producing. Do you know we're sending our preacher's tapes to 50 nations? And you wonder why you won't want to pollute the other 50 nations. But anyhow, and we're sending this out, we're sending and we're doing the other. I don't find any poverty and need. We're self-sufficient now. We, we, we teach young men, teach young men the, the laws of homiletics and we teach them how to, uh, you know, handle the crowd. We teach them how to be good businessmen. In the church. Church business, of course. And this church struts and strides and says, I've got need of nothing. I'm rich. I'm increased in goods. And then suddenly God turns his searchlight on and says, Do you know what you really are? You're naked and blind and wretched and poor and miserable. Well, if that isn't devastating, what is? In other words, you're stripped naked. I see you as you are. You're covering yourself with your own righteousness and your own ability and therefore you've stagnated. Have we taught people to be like this? That they're, that, that they're poverty stricken? You could say poverty is... I, I suppose poverty of spirit is a negative side of faith. <coughs> Remember uh, Isaiah 66 and, and verse 1 To this man will I look to him that is poor and contrite and trembleth at my word. Well, I wonder how many of us this Sunday will enter the pulpit poor and contrite and trembling at the awesomeness. I sometimes wonder where I've been. I honestly do. Man, when I had the most powerful church in, 
in the city, the biggest congregation. I was still in my twenties and people lined up on a Sunday night like a movie house to get in and my name was in the paper for this or doing that or doing something else. Now I thought I, the world was all spinning around me. And when I look at it now, I say, Lord, I just about fed them with sawdust. I sure didn't give them the things they should have needed. It's true that church is still going on today. And I passed it in 1934. And it's still about the best church in town. And out of it, that while we were there, about ten young people went to the mission field. Not just a Bible school, but actually passed through and went to the mission field. And it was great. But oh, if I'd taught them some other things, I can see where they would have been much richer. You see, I felt I was rich. I felt I was adequate. I felt because I was in big demand. I felt because I had a certain position in our movement. I was one of the founders of it. I got tricked. It took me a long while to get out of that. You know, the higher you go up in your pride, it's like climbing that mountain. If you were up just to the first level there, it would be something to fall off. If you got to that top peak and fell off, it's a pretty humiliating, shattering thing to, to come tumbling down to the bottom. And yet, if we do not humble ourselves, what will he do? He'll humble us. God resisteth the proud, and pride is the opposite of poverty and need. He saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Again, he warns, don't lay up treasure for yourself on earth. You, if you've no treasures, you can leave more money than the rocky fellows. And you may have given a lot to missions, and you may have done other things, and you may have starved your relationship with God. And in his sight, you may now have no fruits of the Spirit. You may have no gentleness and no meekness. <coughs> You see, God is a good husbandman and he sure knows how to do the pruning. And let you get out of line at all, you know this, he'll give you a jolt. After all, he lets this superman, the Apostle Paul, be in weariness and fastings and painfulness and tribulation and distress. Why? For fun? He proves that you can put a man into any vicissitude of life and, and when you get where Paul got, you see, because he answered it all one day about his pride as a Pharisee. Whoever stripped himself of more, of the tribe of Benjamin, of the seed of Abraham, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, that's going somewhere. To be a Pharisee is something to be a Pharisee of a Pharisee. That was the greatest religious club on earth. They were the most moral, perfect, upright bunch going in, in human righteousness and religious righteousness. And yet he says, all things that were gained to me, I counted them but lost. The literal word is, I counted them but done. They were as offensive as a pile of horse manure up there to God. And I thought this was a first class religion. I thought you just kept new moons and Sabbaths and you bestowed what you had on the poor and did many things. And all the time God says, you're finding a lot of self-satisfaction, self-gratification, self-importance. And that's the very opposite of humility. All the self, 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 self has to go. And so he said, one day I went to the cross. And he writes about it afterwards in Galatians 2.20. And he doesn't say, I remember ten years ago after I'd been saved for so many years, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost or I got sanctified. He uses a tougher word. He says, I am, not I was, I am crucified. And with this I finish, I believe again the biggest challenge to the average Christian, if you're really walking in the light, is come down from the cross and save yourself. Why should you live like this? They don't live like that, do they? No, God's working on you, not them. Do you think any man's going to be embarrassed when he gets to the throne of God that he did the will of God in face of earth and hell and in-laws and outlaws? I mean, I don't know why my Mary Jane's gone to a place like last days. I mean, she's got ability. My son's working on a computer there and he could be, my goodness me, he could be getting $1,500 a month. He's not even getting 1400 up at last days. I mean, what's he doing up there? Isn't that how parents think usually? It's amazing how many people come to me for counsel. We had one not long ago. Well, I've done so many years studying this, so many years studying that, and uh, I feel God wants me to do it, and, and Dad and Mum say, no, wait another year, or do this. And I don't say walk out on them. I say, look, this is, you, you've got to settle this with God. But you see, my parents are so good and so godly. Maybe they are, but still they're, they're seeing men as trees walking about. Again, if you don't keep your eyes on the judgment seat, if, if you get your thinking out of focus, if you don't, if you don't read this word and, and, and chew it and, and esteem it as, as Job says above our necessary food, we begin to rationalize in the Christian life. There's so much in the Bible doesn't make sense on the human level. 
Now it doesn't mean that you you become voluntary dirty and you become and go live in a cave and you you make a vow I'll never get married as long as I live and I'll never do this and I'll never do that. You see, the Catholic Church has done that. Their patron saint is Saint Francis of Assisi. Well, I don't know whether he's humble or not. Well, you remember he saw a beggar on the road and he was going to pass him and then he he turned and kissed him. And then when he got a, a, a few hundred yards up the road, he turned back and he looked, and it wasn't a beggar, it was Jesus. Well, that's apocryphal, I'm sure it wasn't true. You see, they glamorize him as a man who gave up so much. Nobody gives up anything for Jesus. Every man who gives something up is a winner. He's going to receive in the li this life blessedness, a bigger house than he had. No, but the blessedness that money can't buy and brains can't buy, the blessedness of inward peace. The internal happiness that belongs to the Christian only. It's not made up of amusement. It's not made up of happiness. It's made not, not made up of ideal <coughs> conditions. Do you think that boy who was shot to death last Saturday had been living with a sword of Democles over his head and saying, we'll murder you tomorrow. No, we're putting it off. They're, they're, they're teasing him, teasing him. I, I'm going to suggest that it was perfect bliss and, 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 and uh, that it wasn't a nervous reaction. It's a human being. And that's happened to many martyrs. And they've gone singing to the scaffold. Why did they go singing to the scaffold? Because as Paul said, they knew in whom they had believed. All you lose if you come to the cross is the penalty of death, the penalty of sin, the fear that sin brings, and in its place comes peace and joy and two riches that you couldn't buy anywhere on God's earth. Or I'll put them this way. The fruit of the indwelling of the Spirit. Love. Why can you buy that? Lust, yes. Love, no. Joy. Why can you buy that? Entertainment, happiness, yes, but not joy. Peace. Why can you buy that? You can't buy it. The man who really knows God has entered not only into peace with God, but he has the peace of God. I think it was Thoreau who was asked once, had he made his peace with God? And he said, our sarcastic, I never quarrel with him. But man is a rebel against God and when he becomes a penitent sinner he has peace with God but there's something more than that. There's the peace of God. Romans 5 says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost but John goes further than that and not only says the love of God but he says perfect love casteth out all fear. Thou will keep him in peace. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. He isn't going to give me something that, that when I've sacrificed all I have, if I put too much weight on it, it's going to snap like that. No man has yet trusted God to the full. I need to come every day and say, Lord, I'm starting out, not on the victories of yesterday. I thank you for them. Not with strength to go forward. Today I need the anointing of your spirit. Today I need wisdom more than I needed it yesterday. I got over yesterday. I haven't got through today. I need patience. I, leave, I, love, I need meekness. I'm going to a world that's totally antagonistic to all I believe. And I want to live pure in an impure world. I want to live righteous in an unrighteous world. I want to live holy in an unholy world. And again, Jesus is not giving us an edu education how to just be exemplary before the world. He's telling us a life. And Paul, I like it when he says in Galatians 2.20, the life which I now live, even in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not a resolution to follow a standard of theology. But his life, because I was dead in trespass, his life has come in. And again, if it's joy, and not just joy, but it's joy unspeakable, it has no boundaries. It's not only peace, it's peace that passeth understanding. And he says there, it's life, but also it's life abundant, abundantly. This is, this is the walk that Jesus Christ wants us to have. This is his standard. And I say again, we need to, <clears throat> we need to read, it. read it. Read it constantly. Read it every day of your life, whatever else you read. Read the Sermon on the Mount and say, Lord, I want to be a living epistle, read and known of all men. Because for sure, the men outside aren't reading the Bible. But they sure read us. You can make all the excuses you say, like people do, well, I'm still carnal, I'm still this, that, the other. but I'll tell you what, in the office where you work, or wherever else you work, they won't accept any alibi from you. 
I'm just mortal and frail and I'm sinful and this. Well, but they won't accept it. They'll say you're making excuses, which is true. We're supposed to live in the world as Jesus himself would live. But we should no longer serve the flesh. No longer serve self. But our lives should be hid with Christ in God. And it's possible only as he has cleansed us and he has indwelt us by his spirit. Father, tonight, we thank you for the possibilities of grace and we do ask that we should be ever expanding in our knowledge, but not only that, in our practice, in our exercise of the things of holiness because the Holy Spirit indwells us. Father, we thank you for the provision you give us in a wicked and perverse generation to be as different from it as it's possible for human beings to be. And finally, we have, even now we have our reward. We have a reward because we're not haunted by our sins. We're not haunted by the footfall of the policeman. We're not afraid of some threat upon us. That's all being dissolved and away. Our desire now is that we may walk in newness of life and, and climb the heights of spirituality and do the will of God. And we thank you for the possibility and thank you for the adequate provision that you've made for us through Jesus our Lord. Amen.